Tonight on The Best Times, we celebrate the Bicentennial of Memphis and tell you about some of the history you do not know. Statistically, your heart may be older than you are. Tonight, you'll find out why you should listen to your heart. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. 2019 is an important year for Memphis and Shelby County because 200 years ago, the city of Memphis was founded on the bluffs of the Mississippi River. In a fashion that has been repeated throughout history, a group of outside developers thought that a city on the river would be a good real estate investment. And so Memphis was born. Tonight we talk with Wayne Dowdy, archivist of the Memphis Public Library, about the early days of our city and some more stories of the history you do not know. Before we get to talking about the stories mm -hmm. that you have about right. uh, the history we don't know, I want to talk a little bit about the special event this year, mm -hmm. of course. This is the 200th birthday That's right. That's of the city right. of Memphis and, and Shelby County as well. So we're celebrating this, bi this bicentennial, but since you're a historian, I've got mm -hmm. you sitting in front of me. Right. Tell me a little bit about the founding of the city. How did we get here? Well, if, if we were to go back, 200 years uh, to, uh, to Memphis, we would see um, mostly wooded areas, but uh, on what was called the Fourth Chickasaw Bluff, uh, or what became known as the Fourth Chickasaw Bluff, you would have seen elements of towns. The earliest settler, earliest uh, residents of the Memphis area were uh, several bands of Indians, they went by various names, some of them we don't even know, but they are collectively known as the Mississippian culture. Mississippian because not only proximity to the Mississippi River, but also because they moved beyond sort of traditional hunter-gatherer organizations and tribes to uh, building towns. And uh, a central part of those towns are very large burial mounds. And we can see a burial mound uh, in Memphis. We can see several actually at Chuckalissa, of course, uh, which is, a, which is um, uh, an early Mississippian town. And then also in the French Fort area over by where the Marine Hospital is now is Chickasaw Heritage Park, used to be called DeSoto Park for Hernando DeSoto, who we'll talk about in just a second. And, and um, but there's a burial mound there. And uh, through archeological work, um, uh, archeologists and historians have been able to, to sort of recreate the life. And so it was a very uh, sophisticated town. Uh, they had uh, different, uh, uh, different professions, people who made pottery, people who made um, weapons and who made um, things from metal and uh, they traded first with other tribes and then when we start to see Europeans moving into the area, first with, as I mentioned, Hernando de Soto in the, in the 1500s arriving here looking for gold and silver, but instead what he finds is uh, several uh, Mississippian cultures pre-Chickasaw. And um, there, is, um, there, is, there are violent encounters between um, uh, de Soto and uh, the native tribes. Um, DeSoto eventually uh, dies, does not survive to go back to, to um, Spain. 
A uh, hundred or so years later, um, uh, a second expedition comes through uh, represented by the French government. And the Spanish do not really settle this area. They simply are looking for riches. They're not really interested in colonization. Uh, neither are the French, although the, the riches they are looking for is not gold and silver, but fur. The fur trade in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries is very, a uh, very sophisticated economy, ties North America to Europe, ties this area to Europe for the first time. And so uh, the French built a fort here and uh, recognizing its strategic location, uh, high on uh, the bluff, overlooking the Mississippi River. And uh, so the French built a fort here Eventually, uh, there, is, there is a struggle in the 17th century um, and 18th century over who in Europe is ultimately gonna control this area, whether it is gonna be the Spanish, the French, the English, and then of course the American Revolution comes and uh, the United States lays claim to this area. And uh, uh, eventually the, when America begins to in the 1790s begins to claim this area and um, wants to establish a fort here. Then the Spanish decide to um, reintroduce their control over this area. Memphis becomes the capital of the Spanish Mississippi Territory. The governor of the Mississippi Territory, a man named Manuel, um, uh, Governor Manuel de la Gayoso, which is a name that is familiar, familiar to most familiar from, name, yeah. yes. And, um, so you see uh, a Spanish culture begin to develop here, although it doesn't last very long, a couple of years. The Spanish are eventually pushed out through treaties with the United States. And so the United States establishes a fort here, and even more importantly, they establish a trading post, which was called a factory. And uh, by this time, these various Mississippian tribes had uh, evolved, some tribes died out, others joined other tribes, took on a new name, and eventually became the Chickasaw Indians, which were the dominant tribe in, uh, in the Memphis area when uh, Europeans really began to settle this area. So in, um, uh, so the Chickasaws nominally control this area, although they use it mostly for a hunting ground and some trading, but no permanent towns. Uh, the Chuckalissa town has disappeared by this time. And uh, so there is no permanent sort of Chickasaw town here. So they're in and out of this region. And um, so the United States establishes the trading post to trade with the Chickasaws. And, um, uh, but at the same time, the United States lays claim to this property. The state of North Carolina claims that this area belongs to North Carolina. Um, of course, Tennessee is founded in 1796, so, so there's a disputed claim with Tennessee. And then um, there are Revolutionary War soldiers who were given land grants instead of pay during the war. And there was a man named John Rice who was given a land grant for this area. He eventually sold it uh, to uh, Marcus Winchester, uh, John Overton, and, uh, and then Overton shared part of his, part of the land grant with Andrew Jackson, his close friend. And so they are the ones who claim ownership of the land. So when the United States signs a treaty with the Chickasaws in 1818, then um, the federal government buys the land from the Chickasaws and then they honor, at least in part, the land grants that had been claimed by um, Jackson, Overton, and Winchester. And so so, that's, so in a way, Memphis was a business deal. Memphis was a, yeah. absolutely a business deal between the Chickasaws, the United States government, and the three men who were collectively known as the proprietors. <laughs> and they are the ones who lay out the town and who establish the promenade, for example, downtown, which of course we're still discussing because it was set aside to be public land in perpetuity. So um, that's where, that's, that's how Memphis is founded and it's because of its location on the river. It's, uh, uh, it was already an important trading center before the city was founded 
and laid out and of course would continue after. And, and these investors I'm sure saw the value in that. They did indeed yeah. and um, they, um, they hoped that Memphis would become a major metropolitan center in this part of the world because of its uh, connection to the river, its, its close proximity to the river. And in some ways, uh, their dreams were, were fulfilled. In other ways, not so much. Uh, it took a long time for Memphis to grow after 1819. Memphis was populated by and large by uh, poor people uh, river men and their families who settled in this area who weren't terribly interested in government of any kind. And uh, so there was this struggle between the, um, the settlers who were already here, who didn't want to be controlled, they certainly didn't want to pay taxes. And uh, from there, uh, the proprietors who want this to be this metropolis. And they want to keep it this small little place that they control. And in some ways, that's a story that continues it's, to today, it's, right? It's amazing how history just follows. That's right, doesn't? exactly. All right, well, let's talk about, now that we've celebrated mm -hmm. a little bit of our bicentennial, let's, let's talk about some of the history we don't know. Mm -hmm. The first thing that you sent me about the Cynthia Milk Fund. Now, yes. I had heard of the Cynthia Milk Fund right. in the past. I knew of it as a charity. Right. I was curious as to what happened to it because I right. haven't seen it in the news lately. That's but right. this is over 100 years old, right? That's right. In 1914, there was a the assistant society editor of a local newspaper, a man, a woman, I should say, um, named uh, Memory McCord, which is an unusual, great name, great name <laughs> right especially there. for a reporter, right, yeah. who has to memorize things. Um, but she doesn't write under but, that. But thing. she does not, which is which is interesting to me. But um, anyway, Memory McCord, assistant society editor, but she also she's not she doesn't just cover uh, sort of society events. If, if 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 a story breaks, the city editor has to find somebody to go cover a story. Well, he pulls whoever he's got, and on this particular day in the winter of 1914. He gets a tip about uh, some sort of violent incident that's taking place in an apartment building in a poor part of downtown. So he doesn't have anybody else who says, hey, Memory, I need you to go out and cover the story. He gives the address. She rushes over there, knocks on the door, and the door swings open, and she realizes this is not the apartment I was sent to because there's nothing going on here. But she sees and a, a very emaciated woman, young woman, and uh, sees, you know, there's almost no furniture in this place. Uh, it just looks as poor as any place she's ever seen. And she, out of the corner of her eye, she sees a pile of what she thinks are rags on the floor. And so she's sort of taking all this in and trying to figure out why am I here and what is going on. She sees the rags start to move. So she goes up to the rags, pulls them apart, and finds a little child, a little baby, uh, just a few months old. And um, the baby is not crying, but it's clear to her that this baby is malnourished. And so is the, so is the woman, and she talks to her, finds, gets her story. Her story was that she and her husband um, had had three children, they were uh, he had a good job, they had a, uh, plenty of food to eat and plenty of money for clothes and shelter and so on. But then one day he uh, contracted a, a quote unquote incurable disease. Now I'm not, the, the newspaper accounts don't say, back then they were a little more delicate about such things. And um, he sought treatment, couldn't work. They quickly found themselves uh, destitute, and he got to the point to where he felt that he was such a burden for his family. They had lost all their savings. Uh, they'd been kicked out of their house. They were living in flop houses like this place his wife and child was at. And when the baby came, he was in such despair that he ended his life mm -hmm. because he felt that his family would be better off without him, which was almost certainly not true, but, but that's unfortunately sometimes what happens. So uh, this woman has nowhere to go. She doesn't know who to reach out to. She's just sitting in this, in this hovel. And uh, what's interesting about, about Memory McCord is, you know, she could have very easily turned away. 
like so many of us do when we were faced with suffering. But instead, she talked to the mother some more. Then when she left, she, there was a drugstore right next to the, the apartment house or very near. And she went to the drugstore and said, deliver milk to this home every day for the next month. And she paid for it. Then she goes back to, the, goes back to her uh, newspaper office and bats out a story and tells everybody in Memphis what, what horrible conditions this woman lives under. Well, Memphis is, has always been uh, a generous place. We may be collectively poor, but we're not ever poor enough to where we don't share what we have. And that's, that's very much a, a part of Memphis history. And this is a perfect example of that. People read the story, were so overwhelmed by um, this woman's situation that they sent food, they sent money, uh, so much that um, the family couldn't use all of it. And so the, the newspaper decided to, it was originally the Memphis Press, then it became the News Cemeter, then it became the Press Cemeter. And uh, the newspaper decided, uh, we're gonna create a fund to help other children as well as this family. And Memory McCord, as we said, is a wonderful name, but she wrote under the name Cynthia Gray, which doesn't ma I, makes <laughs> absolutely no sense to me. But uh, Cynthia Gray was her pen name, so um, it became the Cynthia Milk Fund. And it became one of the most important charities in the city. Uh, at first, it was simply to raise money to provide milk for um, uh, underprivileged children. But starting in the late, in the 1930s and then in the 1940s, uh, the health community, the, the health care community in Memphis decided that there was much more that could be done with this. They started to, um, uh, they started uh, Cynthia clinics all across the city to work with, um, uh, not only to help un, you know, uh, poor children to get the nourishment they needed to develop properly, but also to help the parents learn how to take care of their children. And uh, so we see all of this early childhood development that begins to, to, to be created through the Cynthia, um, the Cynthia clinics. And then uh, they partner with the University of Tennessee Medical School and uh, you know they're, they're raising thousands of dollars every year. The newspaper, it is one of their official charities that they promote heavily. And um, every year, and, and there were, it became, a, a, it was a favorite charity of Elvis Presley, as a matter of fact. That was one of the ones that, uh, that he supported regularly. And um, so the, uh, it grew to be much more than just handing out milk to poor kids. Uh, and Does it still exist? It, it still exists. The commercial appeal, when the press cemeter folded in 1983, commercial appeal took it over and it was their official, one of their char official charities. But in 2005, they dropped it as an official charity. And, uh, but it still exists. It is a part of Le Bonheur Children's Hospital. They have a Cynthia Milk Fund um, um, office and uh, it essentially does what the clinics did and uh, also does um, uh, parenting classes and nutrition classes uh, and works with their clients. So it still very much exists and uh, is still doing great work in remarkable, the community, remarkable. yes. Tune in next week for part two of Wayne Dowdy's interview on the history you do not know. Recently, the Centers for Disease Control reported that nearly three out of every four adults has a heart that is statistically older than the rest of their body. For men, the average was about eight years. For women, about five and a half. One in four deaths in this country is a result of heart disease, many of them heart attacks. But there are some simple things you can do to lessen your risk. Maybe it's time to listen to your heart. What is a heart attack? 
the heart gets blood through the coronary arteries. So these are small, teeny tiny vessels, as small, smaller than this pancreas. The coronary arteries are really small. And these arteries get the blood to the muscle of the heart. When these arteries get blocked, you have a heart attack. And the heart attack basically is a muscle damage to the heart muscle. So if you have a muscle damage, because the blood is not flowing well, because the oxygen is not going well, the part of this heart, of this muscle, dies. That's why it's extremely important to get on those really quick. What causes an arterial blockage? So they're extremely important for a healthy heart to have the coronary arteries to be open and patent. What can block it? A thrombus, a clot, plaque that builds up. It's like you, you clog your pipe. What clogs the pipe? Back again, smoking, smoking, smoking. Cholesterol, of course, other risk factors, genetics we talked about, but smoking, smoking, smoking. What are the signs of a heart attack? So the, the classic is that pain in the middle of the chest called angina pectors. And usually it would radiate to the left arm. Usually it would go down the left arm, numbness. So sometimes patients think it's just a nerve or they're not sure. So that's the classic. Now, along with this, shortness of breath. They, they, they're very hard to catch their breath. Uh, nausea, they get sick in the stomach. They get sweaty. So these are the classic signs of a heart attack. What is a silent heart attack? So silent heart attack is actually, uh, I call it the tricky heart attack because it's, it's more common in, in women and in diabetics. So what is a silent heart attack? It's a heart attack that does not present with the classic signs and symptoms that I was just describing earlier. It, the patient would not have that typical heaviness in the, in the middle of the chest. Actually, they can present with indigestion. And that's the most common simulator or the silent heart attack simulator that worries me a lot. Sometimes very vague symptoms, like just feeling a little sick, having flu-like symptoms, and you're not sure what that is, feeling tired. And again, extreme of, extremes of age, women, uh, diabetics, uh, where they have some nerve endings problems, so they don't have the typical pain that, that a, a usual person would, would have. Who is at risk? So risk factors. That's very important because that's something maybe we can control. Some of it is out of our hands, like genetics. We can talk about this a little bit. Basically, if you are from a family of heart disease where it's common, you, you, especially if it's at a younger age, if a patient comes and tells me my dad died at the age of 30 or 35 from a heart attack, that's definitely a risk factor. But there is nothing we can do about this. High blood pressure, that's part of the risk factors, genetics, also partly controlled by diet, but but partly just uh, you're born with this. You have to, to uh, work on it and work with your doctor. Now, diabetes obviously is another very important risk factor. Having said all that, the most important is smoking, smoking, smoking. And this is in our hands. We can control smoking. I can quit smoking and it's gonna help a lot. If you combine smoking with family history of heart disease or genetics, it's a bad combo. The steps to preventing a heart attack are simple. Quit smoking. Know your numbers, your body mass index and metabolic index. Exercise. Eat a healthy, low-fat diet. Drink alcohol in moderation. Avoid stress whenever possible and laugh a lot.
The simple act of laughing will cause the lining of the coronary arteries to expand. For more information on heart health, go to the website of the American Heart Association. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.